Kiora, welcome, ni hao, welcome, namaste. This is Prashant Khanna once again chiming in on the forensic segment of the course. Uh, today we shall learn a bit more about data acquisition and validation from a forensics perspective. A data acquisition is a process of copying data. For digital forensics, it is the task of collecting digital evidence from electronic media. There are two types of data acquisition, static and live. We shall study a little bit about them today. In this video, you will learn how to perform static acquisition from magnetic disk devices and flash drives. We shall also study the different acquisition methods and then do a few exercises based on the lessons we learn. The objectives of uh, this video are mentioned on the slide. We will start with determining what acquisition methods are and which ones are we supposed to be using and when. We would also be introduced to the acquisition tools that are there for creating a forensics image. You will do a group exercise and a couple of group exercises to practice those today. We will also learn how to validate forensics data and ensure its integrity. We will then look at uh, a review uh, what ProDiscover Basic or Access Data FTK Image Lite can do for you. And you can probably access that using the link provided here or use the Linux drive that you guys have already created. Let's spend some time on understanding what the storage formats are. Now, data in a forensics acquisition tool is always stored as an image file, uh, typically in an open source or a proprietary format. Each vendor has unique uh, features, so different proprietary formats are available. Depending on the proprietary format, many forensic analysis tools can read other vendors formatted acquisitions as well. So for example, if you were using NCase, you could probably use a, a image file that was created using uh, Pro, Pro Basic or Belkasoft and, and vice versa. Depending on the proprietary format, many forensic analysis tools can read other formatted uh, acquisition files. However, they may not be able to do all the forensics operations on them. Now, because of that, many forensics acquisition tools create a disk to image file in an older open source format, also known as RAW. They can do it in their proprietary format or do it as a RAW. Now, the, there is a new open source format, which is called as a advanced forensics format or AFF that is gaining recognition from many forensics examiners. Now, each data acquisition format has a unique feature and they have their own advantages and disadvantages. Let's look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of each of those three that are mentioned on this slide. Let's start first with the raw format. In the past, there was only one practical way of copying data for the purpose of evidence preservation and examination. Examiners performed a bit by bit copy from one disk to another disk, the same size or larger. As a practical way to preserve digital evidence, vendors and some operating system utilities such as Linux DD command, which you will use today, made it possible to write bitstream data to files. Now this copy technique creates simple sequential flat files of a suspect drive or data set. The output of these flat files is referred to as a raw format. This format has unique advantages and disadvantages to consider when selected as an acquisition format. The advantage of raw format is that it is a fast data transfer and the capability to ignore minor data reads on the source drive exists. In addition, many forensics tools can read the raw format, making it a universal acquisition format for most tools. One disadvantage of the raw format is that it requires as much storage as the original disk or data set. Another disadvantage is that some raw format tools, typically freeware versions, might not collect marginal or bad sectors on the source drive, meaning that they have a low threshold of retry reads or weak media spots on a drive. Now, several commercial acquisition tools can produce raw format acquisition and typically perform a validation check by using cyclic redundancy check or CRC32. Uh, it could be message uh, digest 5 or md5 as we know that and a secure hash algorithm or sha1 or later hashing function these validation checks however usually create a separate file containing the hash value 
Now we would be conducting a couple of exercises using this particular format as the uh, forensics format later in the class today. Now let's talk a little bit about proprietary formats. Uh, most commercial tools have their own format for collecting data, digital evidence. Proprietary formats typically offer several features that complement the analysis tool, such as the option to compress or not compress image files of a suspect drive, thus saving space on the target drive. Uh, the capability to split an image into, uh, when I say image, I mean a forensic image, uh, into smaller segmented files for archiving purposes. I mean, you could actually create, you could have a large file and you could segment that into small files so that they could be fitted into a CD or a DVD or some other medium. And thirdly, the capability to integrate metadata into the image file, such as date and time of acquisition, hash value of the original file or medium, investigators or examiner's name and the command and the case details. Now, something that like that could actually be fitted right into the format file. Now, one major disadvantage of proprietary format acquisition is the inability to share an image, forensics image, between different vendors, uh, different computer forensics analysis tools, etc., etc. Now, does this ring a bell regarding cloud? Uh, you got something on a particular format on maybe AWS? Would you be able to just port that onto maybe Google? Doesn't happen. So that's where the whole, it, it's more of a commercial issue. Now, another problem with proprietary formats is a file size limitation for each segmented volume. Uh, typically, a proprietary format tool produces a segmented file of 650 MB. Now, the file size can be adjusted up and down with a maximum file size per segment of no more than 2 gigabytes. Most proprietary format tools go up to 2 gigabytes because many examiners use a target drive formatted as a FAT, which has a file size limit of 2 gigabytes. Now, this will change and it actually it is also changing as we speak, but it's good to know that. And finally, let's let's spend a couple of minutes just on the advanced forensic format. Now, Dr. Simon L. Garfinkel, he developed an open source acquisition format called the Advanced Forensic Format or AFF. This format has a, had the following design goals. Number one, capable of producing compressed or uncompressed image files. Number two, no size limitation restrictions for disk to image files. Number three, space in the image file for segmented files for metadata. Number four, simple design with extensibility. Five, open source for multiple computing platforms and operating systems. And finally, internal consistency check for self-authentication. Now, I have, I have I provided you a paper uh, which will be there on uh, the video and also on the extract of this particular PowerPoint presentation. And you can have a look at what this format means. It'll be a good thing for you to learn. There are two types of acquisitions, static acquisition and live acquisition. Typically, a static acquisition is done on a computer seized during a police raid. For example, if the computer has an encrypted drive, live acquisition is done with a password or passphrase is available meaning the computer is powered on and has been logged on to by the suspect. Now, static acquisitions are always a preferred way to collect digital evidence. However, they do have the limitation in some situations, such as an encrypted drive that's readable only when the computer is powered on or a computer that's accessible only over a network. Now, some solutions can help decrypt drives that have been encrypted with the whole disk encryption, such as, you know, in case or other descriptors or something similar. Now you 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 recently known about the live and the static type of acquisition, but there are four distinct methods of data collection. Now these methods are mentioned in the slide here. We shall discuss these in detail. However, it's important to remember that each of these methods have their own advantages and disadvantages, and its use is dependent upon the specific forensic circumstance. Now, the first one is creating a disk to image file. The second is creating a disk to disk file. Uh, the third and fourth are creating a logical disk to disk or disk to data file or a sparse data copy of a file or a folder. Now, we will cover this uh, into three segments. That will be disk to image files, uh, disk to disk files, and creating a logical or a sparse data file. Now, creating a disk to image file is the most common method and offers the most flexibility for your investigation. With this method, you can make one or many copies of a suspect drive. 
These copies are a bit for bit replication of the original drive. In addition, you can use forensic tools like ProDiscover or NCase or FTK, SmartSuit, Clit, uh, X rays, forensic, etc., to read the most common type uh, of disk to image files you create. Now, these programs read the disk to image file as though it was the original disk. For older systems, you could actually use a MS DOS version, but in the case of MS DOS tools, you can only read data from a drive. Sometimes you can't make a disk to image file because of hardware or software errors or incompatibilities. This problem is more common when you have to acquire older drives. For these drives, you might have to create a disk to disk copy of the suspected drive. Several emerging tools can copy data exactly from an older disk to a newer disk. These programs can, uh, you know, adjust the target disk geometry. That means its cylinder, its head, and track configuration so that the copied data matches the original suspect drive. Uh, th these tools include NCase, uh, SafePack, or Snap, Snap Copy. You can also do the same using uh, Belkasoft Evidence Gather. So what happens if you, have, uh, if, you have, if you have to collect evidence from maybe a large drive? It can take several hours. If your time is limited, uh, consider using a logical acquisition or a sparse acquisition data method. A logical acquisition captures only specific files of interest or the case or specific types of file. A sparse acquisition is similar, but also collects fragments of unallocated or deleted data. Now you can use this method only when you don't need to examine the entire drive. An example of a logical acquisition is uh, maybe an email investigation that requires collecting only outlook.pst or .ost files. Another example is collecting only specific records from a large RAID server. If you have to recover data from a RAID or a storage area network server with several exabytes or more of data storage, the logical method might be the only way you can acquire the evidence. In e-discovery, with the purpose of litigation, uh, logical acquisition is becoming the preferred method, especially with large data storage systems. Which acquisition system to use for an investigation? Uh, you, you have to consider the, you know, the sizes and other things, but we'll quickly come to that in the next slide. Now, please remember uh, the choice of the acquisition method you use for an investigation, you need to consider the size of the source or the suspect disk. Then, whether you can retain the source drive as evidence or must return it back to the owner. Third, how much time you have to perform the acquisition. And finally, where is the evidence located? Now, if you need, these are four standard things you need to always keep in mind while you are conducting a uh, uh, investigation. Now we'll stop here for a moment and have a quick look at some of the exercise files we have created for you. You will now make it into groups and then perhaps do one of the exercises. We will come back to the exercises uh, after, uh, after, after the knowledge check one, after we finish that uh, particular exercise. Thank you. So now welcome back. Uh, let's now work, start our work again on how you deal with forensic images. Now, because you're working with digital evidence, you must take precautions to protect it from losses. Now, you should also make contingency plans in case software or hardware doesn't work or you encounter a failure during an acquisition. Now, the most common and time consuming technique for preserving evidence is creating a duplicate uh, of the, your disk into two image files. Many dig digital investigators uh, don't make duplicates of their evidence because they don't have enough time or resources to make a second image. However, if the first copy doesn't work correctly, having a duplicate is worth the effort and resources. Be sure that you take steps to minimize the risk of failure in your investigation. Now, when you, in, in, during 
earlier times when people, you, the students used to be in the class and you had to actually acquire the evidence from the evidence file uh, or the evidence PC, you had to actually create two files, two different uh, image files. But because we're not be doing that, I'm only covering this uh, as, as, a, as a theoretical concept. But as a best practice, always make uh, two image copies. And if possible, please at least uh, use two different methods of using it. As a standard practice, make at least two images or digital evidence you collect. If you have more than one image uh, tool, use the first copy with one tool and the second copy with another tool. Now, some acquisition tools don't copy the data in the host protected area or the HPA of a disk drive. Check the vendor documentation to verify that its tool can copy a drive's HPA. For these situations, consider hardware acquisition tools that can access the drive at the bias level, such as maybe a ProDiscover or NKS or Belkasoft. Now, Microsoft has added whole disk encryption with BitLocker to its newer operating systems. Now, this makes performing static acquisitions more difficult. It's, it's an open challenge in the, in the forensics world now. Now, for static acquisition or most whole disk encrypted drives currently involve decrypting the drive, uh, which requires the user's cooperation in providing their decryption keys. Now, many decrypting softwares require physical de decryption of the drive. This is both a time consuming as well as a laborious process. Please be aware that there are privacy concerns and there are certain sensitive management concerns when you have to conduct uh, a static acquisition or even a even a regular acquisition and you have to be careful when you're doing this as a uh, as a forensic examiner team leader so be aware of this and plan on contingency the effort and time you spend on this kind of a planning will pay very rich dividends down the line now a couple of words on how acquisition tool for windows actually work uh, the major advantages of tools for windows is that it makes you know Acquiring the evidence from a suspect drive much more convenient, uh, especially when you're using hot swap swappable devices. Uh, however, it has some disadvantages as well, especially uh, you must protect acquired devices with a well-tested write blocking hardware device. If you recollect, whenever you try to put in a USB drive into a, into a Windows machine, whether it's a Linux drive or whatever way you have formatted it, it normally infects that in the sense from Francis's point of view, infects it, or at least makes some entry in the registry. Now, write blockers are, are physical devices that prevent that from happening. It, it's a one-way uh, data passing uh, valve, which will only let data pass from the target drive to your, to your acquisition drive and not the other way around. Now, there are, however, certain other disadvantages like the tools can't acquire data from a disk hosted protected area. Not very common to have that anymore. Most of the, you know, the disk acquisition uh, software do uh, provide you with uh, HPA copying. And finally, some countries haven't accepted the use of write blocking devices for data acquisition, especially when used with Windows machines. Now, probably the most critical aspect of computer forensics is validating digital evidence. The weakest point of any digital investigation is the integrity of the data you collect. So validation is essential. Now let's look at the tools that we have to validate data acquisition. Validating data acquisition requires using a hashing algorithm utility, which is designed to create a binary or a hexadecimal number that represents the uniqueness of a data set, such as a file or a disk drive. This unique number is referred to as a digital fingerprint. With a few exceptions, any alteration in one of the files, even changing one letter from an uppercase to a lowercase produces a completely different hash value. Now, exceptions to that are known as collisions, and they have been found to occur in a small number of files with uh, MD5 or SHA1, uh, and they might also be subject to collisions. Now, for forensic examination of data files on disk drives, however, collisions are of little concern. If two files with different content have the same MD5 value, a comparison of each byte of a file can be done to see the difference. Currently, there are several tools that can do a byte-to-byte -byte comparison of files. Now, for images of an evidence file, many GUI tools offer validation techniques ranging from CRC32, MD5, SHA1, till 
SHA 512. These hashing algorithms utilities are available as standalone programs or are integrated into many acquisition tools. Uh, one of the exercises that we shall do today is for you to work as groups and identify how to create a MD5 of uh, a drive uh, of, a, of an image file and then retrieve that and then recalculate the MD5 to check whether the integrity of the file has been maintained. There are standard uh, commands which are in Linux, which are MD5 sum, etc. And you will have to learn how to use that command and perhaps conduct an experiment later in the day today. Now, recent improvement in forensic tools include the capability to acquire disk data or data fragments such as sparse or logical uh, drives remotely. Now, with this feature, you can connect to a suspect computer remotely via a network connection and copy data from it. Remote acquisition tools vary in configuration and capabilities. Uh, some require manual intervention on the remote suspect computer to initiate the data copy. Others can acquire data surreptitiously through an encrypted link by pushing a remote access program to the suspect computer. From an investigator's perspective, being able to connect to a suspect computer remotely to perform an acquisition has tremendous appeal. It saves time because you don't have to go to a suspect computer uh, and it minimizes the chance of a suspect discovering that an investigation is taking place. Most remote positions have to be done as uh, remote acquisitions have to be done as live acquisitions, not static acquisitions. Now, when performing remote acquisitions, advanced privileges are required to push agent application to a remote system. However, it has certain drawbacks. Now, antivirus, anti-spyware and firewall tools can be configured to ignore remote access programs, which is a standard security practice in many organizations. Also, uh, most of these security programs can be configured uh, in a way so that the suspect can install their own security tools to alarm them if you are trying to do a remote intrusion. So there are certain advantages and definitely there are certain uh, disadvantages of using this kind of an acquisition method. This video has introduced you to what acquisition is, what are the different uh, methods of doing it, uh, and also when should you be using which method. Now, this is important from uh, for a for forensics point of view, and you've already done one exercise and trying to understand that. Now, we are doing going to do a couple more exercises as a group, and finally, we shall uh, be using a image file now to derive uh, what you have learned today as a practical exercise. Now, I'll just move over to the next slide and we, we have we have three activities already. You have already done one activity or two more activities uploaded onto Moodle. And then there is a group activity which you will start now and continue to do for the remaining part of the week. Thank you.